we now come to our last speaker, and it's a really great honour for me to introduce Rosamond Adukisi Deborah, CBE, who's been a tireless campaigner on pollution and asthma since the tragic death of her beautiful daughter, Ella Roberta, from asthma attributed to pollution. Good afternoon. Um, I, I am also celebrating um, a 30-year anniversary. Um, I started, um, I did my undergrad degree in 1991, and I started at the Institute of Psychiatry, actually, in 1993. So that's where my story actually um, starts. Um, I think everyone knows my name, and um, is that second slide? Oh, is there another slide? No, just the photograph, actually. Oh. Yeah, that one, actually. So let's go. Right, I'm ready to go. So, um, I always like to say I am a, a mum first and foremost. Um, these are my three dreadful broods over there. Um, everyone probably knows Ella on the left. Um, my son and uh, my daughter, they are twins, um, like I am also. Um, and that, that basically is the sum up of our family. I think I have a confession to make that we are an atopic family. So those of you who are medical will probably know what I, I mean by that, we are. And Jonathan Greek has also, hopefully he's not in the room because I'm talking about him, um, he has also identified that my children are more susceptible to air pollution than the average population. There's going to be some genetic research to find out why and they are going to use Ella's data, um, her DNA, because it's still around, believe it or not. So she continues to, is that me? Okay. She continues to um, haunt us still. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak for today. I want to start off by, um, firstly, talking very briefly about Ella, and then mentioning the inquest, and then moving quickly on to Ella's law. Um, some of, uh, maybe most of you in here know her story, but I, I'm not going to assume most of you do. Um, so my son in the middle, he first got, he is actually one of the youngest people in this country to be diagnosed with asthma at the age of one. Let's see what Abby thinks about that. Um, the reason why he was diagnosed with asthma actually was due to severe reflux. So it's got nothing to do with air pollution. And his asthma was not eventful, really. I've got to be honest. He was on a brown, brown inhaler. We never even went to the G, GP just to get, just to our pharmacist, really. So I didn't really have any real experience of um, what, what it meant to really have asthma. And I must admit, a lot of parents do take it for granted. We do. Um, until Ella became ill. Ella became ill. October 2010, and let's say my life has never been the same actually since. When she first became ill, she had a strange sounding cough, and we thought it was a whooping cough. I don't know how I came to that conclusion, because as a teacher, one of the things you've got to make sure is all your children take their vaccinations. So when we ended up um, by December, when she was in a coma at St George's, and when I asked, has she got whooping cough, they sort of looked at me like I, I was mad. And I have to confess that in the beginning, we actually did not know what she actually had. Um, Ella had what is known as hypoxic seizures. I, if she had one on the street, you would think she was having an epileptic fit. So the doctors did actually not know what was wrong with her. So if you look at her notes after she... Um, when she first came to the medical attention, it actually does put in there probable asthma. It doesn't say she definitely had it. We tested her for epilepsy, cystic fibro... I can't name you the amount of things we tested her for. And until this day, I am, I am terribly sorry we put her through all that because we actually didn't know what was wrong with her. But it was very important we got a diagnosis. So she first got her diagnosis in 2011. Um, and one of the problems we had is we didn't know what her triggers were. So we eliminated as much as you can. And by the way, it wasn't from her hay fever. You, you know, hay fever would not give you those severe attacks which she had. And I thought you actually described it really well. 
I thought you were talking about my daughter, actually, uh, because Stephen Holgate has explained to me, finally, what was actually going on inside her body. And you, that is as close to Ella's description as you can ever get. So I'm not going to be talking about uh, what was going inside. I think Paul has actually described what she was going through. Um, and I might ask Paul at some point. Um, no one has still been able to talk to me about her excess mucus, the one that she was suffocating. We still don't know where that was coming from, and you and I might have a... See, I still have, uh, I still have questions to this day. Um, so Ella was under five hospitals, and she saw all the best consultants that there probably were, including Grey Tormund Street, but we literally could not get to the bottom of what her triggers were. She had hundreds of attacks. I'm not sure why I did that. I must say that um, the only reason why you hear about the 28 hospital admissions is because those were the ones that ended up in hospital. So she had a lot more attacks than um, it is on record. And I've actually redacted some of her medical information, because I just think it's a bit much for it to be out there in the open. And we made the decision um, as a family to actually um, do that. When I do go into schools to, to talk to young children about asthma. When I started on this journey, those days, it was one in two children had asthma in their class. It's now three to four. One of the things I'm very, very clear about, though, that Ella did have one of the worst cases of asthma ever recorded in this country. So one of the things I try and distinguish with children, asthma is quite common, is they shouldn't fear. Because I, and I've never gone into a school whereby the head teacher has, you know, written to me or rang me letter and said, all my students are, are terrified after you've been in. No, I definitely reassured them that her case is quite a unique case. The first inquest was September 2014. We didn't really get any answers, really. But the only thing which was of interest to me is that we found out her triggers were to do with something in the air. That much we managed to establish. And no, we didn't think it was air pollution. At the child death review, what they basically said to me, something in the air, Rosamond, can be anything. Um, so that didn't even um, help us. However, on the anniversary of her, her death, the first one, I was getting desperate, and I actually put out in our local newspaper whether anyone can actually help me get to the bottom of what might have happened to her. I knew she had asthma, that is in no doubt, but I was curious as to why did she have it so badly. And I must admit, I do love these geeks who measure air pollution all over the place. They're fantastic. One of them wrote, I mean, I got all sorts of things. Someone said it was down to dairy. I mean, people had all sorts of theories. But I will always remember this one person who said to me, you need to have a look at the air pollution levels around your house the night before she died. And I think someone mentioned it. It's not so much when they have the attack, it's what's happening before. So Ella was a dead girl walking. Um, and he would know what I mean by that. She might have had the final attack on the 15th, but it, it all started a few days before that. Uh, and the reason why I say that is, on the 14th of February 2013, Lewisham recorded its highest air pollution spike ever. So she was on a hiding to nothing, really. At some point or the other, at some point she was going to go with, with the way the air pollution spikes um, kept on happening. Um, so what, what um, her lawyer, so to move that on, I met her lawyer in 2016, I, I think, and that was after the first inquest. And she was looking for people that might have been impacted by air pollution. So when I went to see her, my premise was, I think I might have a story for you, which you might be interested in, but I'm not really sure about it. And Jocelyn Coburn, I must give enormous credit to her. She actually was the one who looked at all Ella's discharge papers, very clever woman, and she then got the um, data from the monitors on the South Circular, might be in front, actually might be behind it, and they actually pinned them together on the X and Y axis, and they could see that every time <laughs> Ella went into hospital, bar one, there was a spike in air pollution. But that in itself, I felt, was not enough. As much as 27 out of 28, and I remember saying to Jocelyn, mm, I'm still not happy about that. And the reason why I wasn't happy about that is Ella had been tested so much over her life. And I think you're going to need a bit more than that. Now, the one thing I did, and I can't really answer why I did it, no idea, 
when she died, I told the coroner's officer to take samples from her body. Stephen Colgate thinks that's the best thing I ever did. He's still not happy with the way the samples were taken. I thought, don't be so fussy, Stephen. But I did. So I remember going into the coroner's officer, and sort of not, not her body, but a drawing was there. And they told me every single, you know, her hair, her nails, everything, her lungs, they had taken samples from. So these were kept at Great Ormond Street. So although we had the 27 out of 28 times, I still said to Stephen Holgate, can you go to Great Ormond Street and have a look at the, D the DNA and the samples that were kept there? Now, what I can tell you is Stephen Holgate spoke to the pathologist, and I'm looking at Ian now. People who still claim that it's not air pollution, Ian has told me, tell them to go and argue with the pathologist if they want to. It was one of the most senior pathologists in the country, was the one who carried out Ellis' postmortem. And he is in no doubt what happened to her. Because what the first inquest, what came out, and I remember sitting in court looking at her, her consultant was, when they opened her up, we didn't know that, but apparently her lungs looked like the lungs of a smoker. And I do remember sitting in court looking at Dr. Zaman, because we were a bit puzzled. Um, because I had seen all the x-rays, I became part of the hospital fabric. And what they used to do is call me backstage to have a look at the x-rays. And not once did we see any of the muck or anything that came up on the x-rays. So that's something for people to be concerned about as, as well. And I'm very good at reading a chest x-ray. And there, there was nothing literally on there. So fast forward on with Jocelyn, we then decided that the original inquest needed to be quashed. And those of you who know about how deaths are recorded, and people have actually said that to me, foolish people say to me, well, it says on Ella's um, death certificate, 1A, respiratory failure. Well, when she died at the time, we didn't know it was air pollution, and you have to put something down. And 1A, by the way, will, will, will never change. If we knew it was air pollution at the time of her death, 1A might have been exposure to air pollution, but we didn't know it at the time. So that is why, for people who question me, that's why air pollution exposure is 1C, because we didn't know it at, at the time. Now, according to the coroner, which, which is the most important thing in his summary, the coroner spent over an hour explaining to people why he had come to the decision he had. Now, in his, and he was the same coroner in the first and the second inquest. Now, what he has said, and it's very, very important, without the illegal levels of air pollution on the road where, where uh, we live, not only would Ella not have got ill in the first place. Does it seem to work? Can this to the next slide? Yes. Sorry about that. No, no, sorry. It's all Right, so this is um, his general stuff. Now, without the illegal levels of air pollution on the South Circle, not only would Ella not have got asthma in, in the first place, she wouldn't have actually died on, on that fatal night. And that is actually... So for all the people who contact me on Twitter, uh, uh, the most latest one was that woman who lived in a council flat that had mould. I don't know what they're talking about. I don't live in a council flat. There's nothing wrong with it. And there is no mould in our house. It seems that even with all the scientific evidence there, people don't want it to be the case. But that is really why she died. And for us, this has given us closure. And we are very grateful for all the people who work in this area. Now also, what people want to do, so what someone did recently, and I, I am very impressed, they went, I have asked for freedom of information, they went. And they went, um, since 20, no, since the year 2000, only one person has died from air pollution. <laughs> I just said that for Frank's benefit. So I thought, goodness me, there was, so, you know, there seems to be a general disbelief out there that air pollution actually kills. And my answer to people who say that is, when your child die, dies, it's devastating. I would never know, I just can't see a parent going, can you take samples from all their body? Because I am generally convinced that if part of the postmortem is taking samples to check for PM 2.5 and things like that, then we will find more people die from. I don't have an answer to the question as, if 7 million people die prematurely every year, 
why is Ella the only person to have it on her death certificate? I can't answer that. That's, and so I'm sure in future there will be more people, but I actually cannot answer because that's the charge that is given um, against me. People seem to, and we, we all realised this weekend what went on against, especially you ladies as, as, as well. And I think I spoke to people this, this weekend, and I do have some advice about the green diagrams which are there, is the way pollution is measured. And what I'm talking about is the coroner used the WHO guidelines. And I say to people who send me green maps, is just put in the current WHO guidelines, 2021, and have a look at how quickly that picture changes. So when you put it in, if it remains green, then come back to me. I'm still waiting for someone to come back to me. I just think the way we measure it here is slightly different, well, it's different from the way um, um, the WHO measure it. Something else to say, that the number of children who die from asthma has not changed since my daughter died. That hasn't changed. It's still between 8 and 12 in London, and it's 22 to 24 nationally. The number of asthma cases, though, is on the rise. Now, why do I remain hopeful? Someone mentioned to me lockdown. The good thing to repeat to you about lockdown, between the 23rd of March 2020 and the 4th of July, I think that's when lockdown was lifted, I'm sure someone will correct me, it is the only time in this country that no child has died from asthma. When Mr Johnson um, reopened, within a month in August in North London, a 14-year-old boy died. So that's my evidence that it is definitely air pollution related. And until we accept this, um, Sir Chris Whitty, in December 2022, did bring out a report on air pollution and, and health. It is there for everyone to read. It is something he is incredibly concerned about. And he is also concerned about excess thefts. And my challenge to the government is, unless you clean up the air, like the coroner said, people are going to continue to die. But can we just remember, it's just not about deaths. It is also about all the um, NCDs, sort of, let's say Parkinson's disease, most heart diseases, most cancers, um, dementia, which I haven't read up on yet. Frank has just done some research on dementia. So this is going to be continue to be a problem. And what I have said to those who are against me or whatever, you either do something now or you'll be forced to do something in the future. You can throw all the money you want at the health service, and governments do. It's not just the United Kingdom. They, they throw trillions at it. It's not going to work unless you clean up the air. Because prevention, as we all know, is better than cure. So where are we now? I knew the government deep down they were not going to do anything about air pollution. I sort of knew. So after the inquest, I did have a choice to make. The inquest was brutal, trust me. It was exhausting. But I, I had a choice to make afterwards. What we set out to do to find out what, why Ella died, we had found out. And the choice I said to my children was, do we continue or do, do we not? I'm glad we continued. The Environment Act came out last year. And what the coroner said to the government, they did not listen. PM 2.5, they decided rather than add it, they were going to put it out to a, a dreadful consultation. Um, and I don't, what are they talking about now? Oh, so now all scientists say this is something that we should be able to achieve by 2030. I think Theresa Kofi, quote unquote, I would love to do it, but I can't. So she, her target is 2030. And I did speak to Frank about it. And just to give you the scale of the problem, my question to Frank was, how many people are going to die prematurely between 2030 and 2040? Because that's what I am interested in, the people are going to die. And I think you said 300,000, if that's correct. So we now move on very quickly to Ella's Law. That has now turned into a battle as well. Um, the situation with Ella's Law now, what I want to do is to enshrine um, clean air as a human right, explicitly into law, because I don't trust them. Um, at the moment, they are not supporting me. So my, my point here is, please write to your MP. And I have to just read this out so that I actually get it right, so you know exactly what Ella's Law is. It is to enshrine the human right to clean air precisely and explicitly in law. 
This is the quickest and the cheapest and best way to improve public health and also to fight climate change. It is to tackle air pollution and green gases together to improve public health, the environment and climate. And it is also to match and exceed the EU's latest proposals on ambient air. They said 2030. Also, although it doesn't apply to Ella, I felt I needed after um, COVID to put indoor air pollution in there. So part of Ella's law includes indoor air pollution, where health and safety privileges apply and a new residential development. What I meant really is schools, building schools on main roads. This also places a duty on local authorities and others to reduce mould. And we did that before, sadly, just the case of power and we died. So this is, by the way, what Ella's Law is about. And my plea to all of you is, it's going to come up again on March the 24th. You need, you need to write to your MPs and insist they actually support it. Because as a family, we believe that everybody is entitled to breathe clean air. And you saw all those families there who are impacted. And that's just people regarding respiratory. There are many other illnesses that we haven't even covered. Um, so do not believe politicians who say, we just need to get more doctors and nurses and everything is going to be fine. They are actually lying to you. And I will conclude by saying, in areas of high air pollution, not only were there more COVID deaths, but COVID was more severe. And I remember the phone call I got on March 1st, 2020, when a senior doctor um, rang me and said to me, there's a situation in hospital and someone's asked me to call you. So I sort of said to them, what, what's the problem? By the way, this is quite usual for doctors to call me. We've got lots of patients in hospital and they have similar symptoms to your daughter. So my response to the doctor, this was COVID, my response to them is, well, if, if they're anything like my daughter, then you're not going to be able to cope with this. And they went, have you got any advice for us? I said, the only thing I can think of is turning the patients onto the stomach, because that's what we used to do with Ella in ICU, and that would allow her to breathe. And that is why Ella will always be the canary in the coal mine.